we're going to give a quick overview, as said, about the, the one health aspects of aflatoxins, what they mean to animals and also to animal source foods. So Johanna is going to start with a presentation on the status quo, well, and then I'll follow up with some of the, the policy implications, and then we can take some questions and answers. A lot of this work has been based on a series of IFPRI 2020 briefs on aflatoxins, which I produced last year along with Laurie and Univer, so that's another source for further information. Over to you, Johanna. So the topic of today is aflatoxins, animal health and safety, uh, and the safety of animal source foods. So we're going to start with an introduction of aflatoxins and mycotoxins. We go over to look at the livestock and fish exposures uh, to aflatoxins, the impact of aflatoxins on animals' health and production, how aflatoxins are transferred to animal source foods, and how we can manage the risk of aflatoxins, both in the animals and in the food. Then we'll continue a bit with the standards for feeds and animal source foods and the policy recommendations for the future. So mycotoxins are toxins or poisons produced by fungi or molds. There are over 500 types of mycotoxins described, and more than four, 200 types of these are found in foods. Aflatoxins are some of the most serious toxins that we know of. They can cause acute disease or chronic illness in both people and animals, including fish. We also have economic losses, and these results from the costs of human illness, the loss of livestock production, exclusion from markets, and the cost of testing and risk mitigation. In addition to the acute disease that can happen, aflatoxins also cause chronic disease, such as cancer, and it's estimated that at least 26,000 deaths occurs annually in sub-Saharan Africa. Looking at the chain of how aflatoxins are transmitted in the food chain, this starts with Aspergillus flavus fungi infecting the crops and in contaminating them with the aflatoxins. Then this continues during storage, especially during poor storage, for example during moist conditions. Animals get contaminated by eating this contaminated crops, and they can thus transfer it into dairy products. And there is an impact on livestock production with reduced econ economic benefits for the farmers, and also econo economic losses due to cost of health treatments, decreased immune, immune defense, and also we have a decreased production of food, which is a problem in food insecure areas. Humans get aflatoxins through the crops they consume and also through dairy products. And the impacts on humans can be either acute or chronic, such as cancer or stunting in children. Species are sensitive, especially young animals and young humans are the most sensitive. And some species, such as rabbits, ducks, cats, swine, and rainbow trout, are highly susceptible and can die of less than one milligram per kilogram body weight. In fact, one teaspoon of aflatoxins is enough to kill 2,500 rabbits. Dogs, horses, calves, turkeys, guinea pigs, sheep, and tilapia are moderately susceptible, whereas chickens, rats, mouse, hamsters, shrimps, and bees are relatively resistant. In one experiment, broilers were fed 3,000 parts per billion of aflatoxin, and you can see in this picture how the chickens that got no aflatoxin grew much better than the ones that were fed aflatoxins. And you can also see that there was a big difference in livers, and the poisoned chickens had enlarged fatty livers. In pigs, it was shown that an extra 1,000 parts per billion caused a 4% decrease in body weight, and in broilers, that was 5% decrease in weight. But in fact, the different levels of aflatoxins that are tolerated are much higher than the current standards. For example, we know that 50,000 parts per billion will kill the majority of animals, 1,000 parts per billion causes major impacts in production and immunity, and 500 parts per billion also causes an impact. Whereas when we reach levels down to 100 parts per billion, this is generally to tolerated by most animals. There can be some side effects such as a bit of decreased immune defense, but it's generally tolerated. And today, the current East African community standard is around 10 to 20 parts per billion. And when looking at animal feed service in Africa, 
we can see that most of the feed had levels that were lo lots above the standards. In fact, 100% of the feed sampled had levels above the EU or the East African standards. When animals eat it, as you mentioned, it is metabolized and transplanted into the milks, the eggs, and the meat, and especially milk and traditionally dried or smoked foods can have the highest levels, and so should they should be given the highest attention. Especially milk is a problem since this is often targeted towards young and infant children. But if you retail the aflatoxin contaminated food from the livestock for a couple of weeks before you slaughter them, it is enough to clear the toxins so that muscle tissues and organs are safe. There has been a number of studies testing aflatoxins in milk, and most of them, as you might be able to see from this map, showed rather low ranges of aflatoxins. Whereas some, some showed a bit higher, but the majority had rather low levels. So this is a bit of the, the, the background and the status quo, and we can see that aflatoxins are, they are ubiquitous in nature. They're present in a lot of animal food in developing countries. They definitely cause impacts, but their full impacts and costs are, are not fully known, nor how, how best to manage it. So now we're moving more on to the take-home messages and the policy recommendations. So the major way which uh, people have attempted to control and manage aflatoxins in the livestock industry is through standards, through limits, which, which feeds should not exceed. There are various justifications and, and logic behind these standards that the first and the predominant one is to protect humans, protect human health from harmful aflatoxins and animal source food. And here, as we said, milk is the one we really worry about because when we look at the evidence, it is the one which you get the highest amount of aflatoxins in it, and also it's targeted at the most vulnerable infants. But standards of other purposes, including to safeguard the benefits people derive from livestock and fish by, by not ensuring that they don't get poisoned and sickened by aflatoxins, to protect value chain actors from fraudulent products, for example, poor farmers who may buy dairy feed thinking it's going to increase his milk, but in actual fact it, it's, it's having bad effects on the cow. To encourage trade and business and competition because people trust that when, when the standards are followed and to safeguard the welfare of animals. And, and most countries we look at, including most African countries, have now got explicit, explicit policy objectives that recognize animal welfare as something to be obtained. But when we're thinking about feed standards, it, it's useful to differentiate between things which are kind of really essential, as in protecting human health, and others which are things we would desire, like supporting trade. But we f sometimes find that, in actual fact, the standards are not really always um, followed strictly in developing countries. And then the other thing we need to think about is that standards and, indeed, all regulatory mechanisms of inspection or control as well as benefits. We don't have really much information about the cost of uh, aflatoxin control in developing countries because up to date no developing country has, got, has managed to control aflatoxins or has got a working system to control aflatoxins in, in human foods. We do know that in the US aflatoxin control uh, costs around half a billion dollars a year. And that across a couple of studies, aflatoxin control costs, you may estimate them at around 2 or 3% of the total value of the crop protected. So that is quite a lot for Africa. That means uh, just extrapolating and assuming that it's just as easy and cheap to, to regulate in Africa as in the U.S., that would mean maybe $70 million a year. So, of course... Policymakers are always interested. They want to know the costs of a problem. They want to know the benefits of averting it, but they also want to know the costs of controlling it and who's going to pay those costs. And these are important questions for us. Um, when we did, we reviewed the standards for aflatoxins. This was based mainly on a, a two big surveys done by the FAO, the last in 2003, but also more contemporary information on standards. And we looked at more than 100 different standards in different countries and for different animals. And what we found was there was a very wide range. So it really didn't make a lot of sense. So, for example, the standards for pigs could vary from zero to 300 parts per billion. And it, it, there wasn't much logic as to why one country should have zero and another should have 300. We also found it interesting that the standards were stricter for the foods which were safer. 
Now, there is a, a reason why regulators may want to, to regulate more intensely the very easy foods, the foods which are very safe and, and, and less likely to be problematic because it makes their lives easier, but it's not a risk-based approach. It doesn't help stopping the highly risky foods from getting to, to animals or people. And the other thing we found was that standards were much stricter for non-tropical countries. Aflatoxins are a problem of the tropics, and we find that the countries who are not tropical and who don't have aflatoxins have an average limit of 26 parts per billion, whereas tropical countries have one of 54. And this would suggest either different priorities or else that standards can be used as, as, as barriers to trade. So there's a lot going on in standards, and a lot of it is not actually based on evidence or the health impacts on humans or animals. And one of the things we're trying to do now with, with USAID funding and led by ITA is to develop a more evidence-based approach to, to standards, at least in the East African community. So that was what should we do to manage aflatoxins in animal feeds. It, it's not actually difficult. It's expensive sometimes, but it's not difficult. We need good practices at producer, processor, and retail level, and there's some very encouraging methods such as uh, biocontrol and irrigation and other ways to reduce aflatoxins. We need appropriate risk-based legislation and regulation, which we don't have now. We then need a way of monitoring aflatoxins in feeds and foods and doing something with the contaminated feed. Many of these surveys in, in, in developing countries will, will typically show maybe 100%, 80%, 70% of, of feed is contaminated. What do we do with that? We're not going to destroy it all. So how can we manage some of it more appropriately? Um, and the stuff which can't be managed appropriately, what do we do with it? So the take-home messages. That, that was just looking at some of the policy implications. And now I'm moving on to the take-home messages for the, the entire presentation. The first is, if not controlled at the levels present in developing countries, aflatoxins are reducing productivity of pigs and poultry by around 5%. That may not seem a lot, but when in these intensive poultry and pig production enterprises, which are really being driven by the livestock revolution and the rapidly increasing demand for food, they work on operating on incredibly small margins. So the difference of 5% can easily be the difference of profit or loss and of animal source food available or animal source food not available. On extensive ruminants and extensive pigs and poultry, we have much less evidence, but the impacts are probably less. So if we're risk targeting, we're not going to worry so much about the, the freely ranged scavenging animals. We're going to worry more about the intensive. We suspect that most feed manufacturers add binders. We know that most of them don't admit to it. Binders are, are things you put in feed which mop up aflatoxins and, and stop them, their toxic effects. But around two, to thirds, two to, out of three of the binders people are using probably don't work, so they, they don't do what they're, they're told to do, and this is another big cause of loss. We know that the cost of aflatoxin and regulation and, and control is, is, is quite is reasonably high, but there is a strong incentive for feed makers and industrial farmers to control aflatoxins. So if we can build on these powerful incentives, it may be more effective than, than depending on regulations and rules, which we know in developing countries where we work, most people actually do not follow and governments lack typically a lot of capacity to, to implement. We've seen that by all the surveys we do, which regularly show 50 to 80% exceeds the standards which are present in the country. Um, so how important are aflatoxins then in the animal source foods, the foods derived from animals? Well, our reviews suggest they're probably not something to worry about in fresh meat, fish, and eggs. And they are something which can be managed relatively easily just by withholding aflatoxin feed in the few months, weeks before slaughter. It looks like they may be an important uh, problem in traditionally processed fish and milk, but there's almost no surveys on this. As in many other cases, the indigenous food, the local products which are so important to poor people, are some of the least studied. And, around, and in dairy, where you get this continuous transfer from everything the cow eats in the rumen, a small bit of it goes into the milk, this is where aflatoxins are likely to be a problem. But still, it's not likely to be a big problem in countries where the per capita milk consumption is 10 or 15 kilograms a year. But it is likely to be a problem in those communities and those countries where there is really pretty high milk consumption. So what should we do? In terms of, of this ubiquitous problem, which we cannot remove or eliminate, how do we manage to live with it and control it best and use the scarce resources we have in the most efficient manner? One is to focus 
our resources on managing the high-risk feeds and the high-risk products. At the moment, there tends to be a blanket approach to, to feed products in developing countries. And if we could concentrate on the high-risk, we would get more for our money. Another thing is that the current feed standards, which we've just reviewed, are not really based on evidence and they're not suited to developing country context. If they were to be strictly followed, these feed standards would push contaminated food into the human value chain. We want the livestock value chains to be able to suck contaminated food out of the human value chains into the ruminants and the fattening beef cattle areas where it can do less harm. And even if it does do harm, it's better that a chicken gets sick than that a child gets sick. Uh, we find that in developing countries that um, it's really difficult to get to transfer government regulations, even the best of regulations and policies, it's really difficult to get them translated 100% into practice. So if we can leverage the powerful economic incentives of livestock and uh, manu uh, feed manufacturers and farmers, that may be a better approach. Blending and binders are simple technological solutions with which can work and can be effective. Many developing countries outlaw, outlaw them at the moment because they're just a bit nervous around any technology. But if they could be persuaded that these are something they can safely use, again, that would help make animal feed a good way to draw aflatoxin contaminated food away from children and mothers. Um, so that's basically our suggestions for, for, for the way forward and, and what policymakers and the donor community especially can do. I'd just like to finish by acknowledging some of the many partners who contributed to this work, and then we'll be very happy to take any questions. I think we've kept pretty much to our time. Yeah, hi there. I have a question. Um, the, the milk, if it is processed into dried uh, powder and later on again re uh, uh is uh, aflatoxin then still a critical issue or not? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we didn't actually mention that, but aflatoxins are not destroyed by any kind of heat treatment. There is a certain degradation over time if you let milk stand, but it's generally not destroyed at all. So it's still a problem in milk powder, it's still a problem in all sorts of milk products practically. Cheese, it'll it yeah. persist in, in, in dairy products. I do have another question. Uh, how can actually a contaminated uh, feed, uh, if it is not destroyed and then fed to the animals, uh, of course it's going through the whole whole system then, uh, what what can one do with, let's say, contaminated feed then? Or what is the general advice if, for example, maize is highly contaminated and, and, and the farmer is feeding it anyhow to, to the livestock, what would be your advice? Well, this is, again, um, it's a little bit complicated because sometimes the, the best is the enemy of the good. And in, in many cases, contaminated maize, people would recommend that it, be, that it be buried. But if it is still going to be used in some way, there are two things you can do. The first is to blend down. Now, this is actually not allowed in some countries because it's considered to be a, a risky process. But basically, if you've got one kilogram of highly contaminated maize, and you mix it into 1,000 kilograms of uncontaminated maize, and that goes to make animal feed. The final animal feed is, 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 not, is going to pass all the standards. It's not going to be contaminated. The other thing you can do is to use something called ammoniation, which is uh, industrial technology which just exposes the, the, the feed, the, the maize, to ammonia. And this removes all the aflatoxins. It costs about 5 or 6% of the value of the crop. It requires a plant, an industrial type plant, which is, is difficult to, to build and maintain. But for many years, up till now, um, uh, Senegal uh, ammoniated all groundnuts which it exported to Europe and so was able to continue exporting groundnuts for uh, livestock feed to Europe irrespective of their quite high aflatoxin levels. Ammoniation should only be used um, for animal feed. It changes the color and slightly the taste of the, the corn or the groundnuts, so it's something which is only used for animal feed. And the principle of binders, for example, is that the aflatoxin binds through it and then it passes through the gastrointestinal canal of the animals without being resorbed. So the aflatoxin is not changed in itself, but it's never taken up by the animal. And within the animals, there is a certain meta metabolism, so that within both humans and animals, the poison will be breaking down. The binder, you are mainly referring to uh, different clay types, correct? 
there are clay tr types, there are yeast derivates, for example, yeast cell walls has been used. Um, when this has been studied, it has been shown that many of the binders actually used on the market are not as efficient as they claim. So there is still a lot of research to be done in this area. But it has been shown, on the other hand, that some binders, for example, I won't say the names, but some clay binders have been shown to be quite effective. And you can feed livestock moderately contaminated uh, maize well above what would be acceptable for human consumption. You can feed livestock moderately contaminated grains along with the binders, and then you will have minimal or no effects on their health, production, or productivity. So the three things would be uh, binders, blending, and ammoniation for, for managing contaminated cereals and grains. Well, what happens is not every clay is the same. So, so lots of clays have been tried. And th that figure of two out of three comes from a, a study in Brazil where in, in many countries, I should say, in Europe, for example, and, and parts of America, most of America, binders are not actually legally allowed to be used. You can use cell wall constituents, but you don't call it a binder. You have to call it something else. I mean, the politics the, around these standards is quite complicated. But in Brazil, where they, they did a sort of a big survey, they found that um, two out of three of Binder, uh, binder salt on the market did not work. And the, the reason is easy. You know, the, these are very big poultry pig industries. People are very worried about aflatoxins. They're willing to pay money for, for binders. So unless you have a, a standards authority that can test whether a binder works or not, there's always going to be an incentive for the private sector to just go and produce their clay or their yeast wall, put a, a label on it, mycotoxin binder, and, and sell it to whoever they can sell it. Unfortunately, there's also an aspect of there is other mycotoxins that have an impact within the animal industry, and some binders are more efficient for other types of mycotoxins than aflatoxins. So some binders have been developed and are efficient against other things than actually aflatoxins. Yes, it's actually, it's surprising um, how little evidence there is, how much we're lacking good evidence on aflatoxins. I mean, uh, you've heard in previous talks much more about the human situation, which obviously is a much higher level of concern because you're talking about human lives. But even in the livestock sector, we have very limited information on what is the level in, in animal feeds, what people are doing to manage it, what are the costs of, of, of the, the, in terms of lost production and productivity. The main work has been done, I would say, by um, universities, national, local universities in Africa who have done quite a lot of small-scale studies. Uh, and then the other is the CGIR centers, uh, especially IITA, which has done a, a great deal of work uh, in the crop sectors. ILRI has worked more recently and much more in the livestock sector. USAID has been a big supporter, a big uh, supporter of aflatoxin work, but definitely I think in order to understand the true costs and the most appropriate management, more evidence is needed. But yet the evidence we have is not being used well, and we are seeing things like standards which are actually having paradoxical effects of putting people at risk. We, we see things like that. So, so the evidence we have is not being used as well as it could be, and yet we need more evidence. Yeah. yeah, that is one of the attempts that are being done that exist in US. In the US, they have the so-called aflasase. Aflasase. Think, yeah, that is on the market where a atoxygenic strand of Aspergillus flavus is applied on the fields and crowds out the toxigenic strains. And there are experiments ongoing in Africa as well, in certain countries with local Aspergillus flavus strains that are atoxygenic. And this is very promising results. As it is now, the cost of the applications is higher than most farmers can afford. Developing country farmers. Yes. Well, for, for a smallholder, there is simply no money to put on these products at the moment. So there's still a lot to do, and this is a very promising approach, the biocontrol aspect of it. 
But there's a lot of research ongoing on that, and the CGR systems are working in different countries now in Africa. And as it is, we are also looking very much at working on local strains in order not to transfer dif different Aspergillus strains across Africa. It's a very nice technology, but yeah. it costs about $15 a hectare. At the moment, mm -hmm. the average farmer in sub-Saharan Africa spends $7 a hectare on fertilizer, and he would really get a lot of improvements from his crop by spending $15 on fertilizer, but he or she isn't doing that. So that it's a big ask to then say another $15 yeah. for, a, for an aflat, uh, atoxygenic fungi. But on the other hand, because aflatoxin, I think if we can gather the evidence showing the magnitude of the problem of aflatoxins, then we might not expect the smallholder, the small farmer, to bear all the costs of a public health problem himself. So the rationale would be how do we share those costs so that it's not just all falling on the small farmer's pockets, but public health and, and other people join in. Um, yeah, I was interested in um, the whole aflatoxin and milk and young children because we know that in uh, some societies that are more pastoralist with more animals, women stop breastfeeding earlier than they would if it was a non-cow society. So I think maybe you're doing some work to look at where is the aflatoxin load the highest? Is it in breast milk because women are consuming um, contaminated foods? Or is it in cow's milk because they're consuming com contaminated food? This is a very good question, actually. We know that as aflatoxins are in the breast milk of the women, and we know it is in the milk of the cows as well. And we are right now actually doing a risk assessment, trying to look at the relative importance of milk for children in different areas of Kenya, trying to look at the consumption levels, the levels of aflatoxins in the milk, and the relative importance of that compared to other sources of food. At the moment, we don't actually have an answer to this, but it's definitely a very important thing. I think some of the what the preliminary things we could say, and again, a risk assessment is really needed to put numerical numbers on it. But we know that at the moment, mothers in parts of Kenya are also weaning their kids onto maize, which is highly contaminated. Milk is, is often not is is rarely as contaminated as maize because the milk is kind of uh, has less aflatoxins than whatever the cow ate. Um, so. Early weaning onto um, anything with maize and groundnuts in it and milk is probably more dangerous than continuing to breastfeed, even if the mother has got aflatoxins in her milk. Yeah. As the situation is now in many parts of Kenya and sub Saharan Africa, is that aspergillus is so ubiquitous and aflatoxin is kind of present, present in more or less high levels in most products, which means that it gets a trade off. You can have the breast milk, which is contaminated with some levels of aflatoxins. We know that the cow milk is contaminated with levels of aflatoxins, and but we also know that all kind of alternatives usually can contain the same or at least higher levels of aflatoxins as well. That's great. So um, I'm not sure when your study um, will be completed, but we will be able to invite you back to speak to us again when you have the study in. Definitely. That's very interesting. <laughs> Because I think it's a sort of, you know, we, we advocate exclusive breastfeeding for six months, but then, you know, if they start weaning on to maize, you know, there's an open question. The child needs far more nutrients than they would get from breast milk and far greater quantity. But if what they're going to be given is going to actually deplete their growth, it's sort of, it's, it's a very strange question to sort of say, should you almost be starving your kid to stop them being contaminated with aflatoxins, which is going to give them a major growth failure? I think if there was any way of increasing the diversity of weaning foods and especially adding small yeah. amounts of, you know, animal source food, liver, things like that, eggs, but yeah. certainly this is when kids are weaned onto high maize or high ground nut weaning foods, it can only be a disaster. And what we don't want neither situation is, is a lack of evidence, is to cause some kind of panic where parents yeah. fear, fear to fear, feed their children because they are yeah. afraid of the potential aflatoxins, when we know there's aflatoxins in practically everything else. And for many poor smallholders, there are no alternatives in the household. Yeah. They have maize products, they have some milk, and that, those are the alternatives the children can have. 
Did I throw a, a question which I would hate to be asked? So, but I'm going to throw it anyway, and you can decline it. If I mean, if you had one thing that you could change in relation to aflatoxins, you know, one policy, one strategy that a group could do, what would it be? It's hard to say the one thing, you know, because I, I think there are several different things. Well, uh, let me say this. This is not from a public health perspective, but from a live, livestock perspective. One thing I would like to see is the animal food chains really acting as, as, as I was saying earlier, sucking out the most contaminated cereal because they can use it either with binders or blending in other ways and provide an alternative which, which for, for people's maize so that it's, it's just drawing it out of the human food chain. And yet converting it into something of value because we know in developing countries uh, contaminated maize, maize which is over the limits, it, it's a really big ask to expect that all that will be taken away and, and buried somewhere, especially when it can be 30-40% of the harvest. So from a livestock perspective, that's what I would like seeing happening, livestock food chains really driving public health improvements. Yeah, I would agree on you, with you on that. And also one thing that would be good would be a general increased food security, of course, but that's a very yeah. very hard ask <laughs> to get. But if people would feel more secure with the food they have, they would dare to dry them better and not feel stressed about having to keep the maize inside because they're afraid of test or they're afraid of losing it and could thus dry it in a way they know is more proper. But that's a hard task. And if I could just ask for one other quick thing, which would be really nice. <laughs> it would be the, the one cent aflatoxin test, a little bit of paper which you drop yes. in your milk or you put in your ugali and stir it around, and it comes back bright red if it's, you shouldn't eat it, and it comes back out green if it's fine to eat. I think that would help people, give people a lot more control too over their health and, and what they consume. Any chance that test is going to be available anytime soon? Um, not soon, but it is technology. We're technology not that far off, off the technology. I have a quick question talking about this uh, communication bit of it. Um, I was wondering how aware are people, uh, um, the, the farmers, about the problem? And what, what would you think would happen if they had that uh, little uh, test kit available? Isn't it a little bit about uh, the, the political level that needs to put in some money to get that whole awareness going? What do you think? You said in the beginning in the United States there's a billion dollars a year or something spent on aflatoxin. Well, I mean, it has been shown that people in at least Kenya are fairly aware of aflatoxins. There has been a number of outbreaks where hundreds of people have died acutely, and therefore you have a bit of attention in the mass media. So on average, we see a rather high awareness. Everyone is not really aware of how it works. But we also have tried to do a couple of willingness to pay studies where we can see that people are generally willing to pay a bit extra for having safe products. But at the same time, we know that very poor people often do not have the luxury of eating the safe products they would prefer. And so, yes, it, it's likely that... It's not enough, shall we say, that people know there is an aware, and even though they worry about it, 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 that won't be enough to solve the problem. And in addition to that, any kind of rapid test like that would, of course, have to be followed by very straightforward recommendations, maybe different levels, saying to the farmer, if it turns this color, don't eat it, give it to the cow. If it's this level, don't feed it to anything. Just burn it and use it as charcoal. Or so that the instructions are really clear. But we also have to be really aware of, for many families, there are no alternative food. So we can't just tell people to throw away the only thing they have on their plate. 